In this edition of Israel Vision, you will join your hosts, Dr. Jay and Meridel Rawlings, as they welcome a Christians for Israel tour from Canada. Come with us as you will gain fresh insights and new biblical perspectives of the Holy Land today. <laughs> This month, we want to thank you for becoming a very important part of a movement on behalf of Israel, a prayer movement that has started here in Jerusalem as we at U Jerusalem Vista's Israel Vision have become united with Christians for Israel, creating the Prayer Link team. And we are very encouraged to hear that the number has grown to 140 prayer groups alone in Canada. You know, it as a pastor living in Canada and, and certainly living in North America and the Western world, there is great ignorance concerning the Jewish nation and our relationship to Israel as Christians. There are even those who think, wrongly so, that the church has somehow replaced Israel in the plan of God. That because the Jews were disobedient and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70 and they were dispersed, that God has set them aside. And we, the church of Jesus Christ, have replaced them. But this is not the truth. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear in the book of Romans in chapters 9, 10, and 11 that we have been grafted in to the root of Israel. And so in that sense, our Christian roots go all the way back, of course, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but back to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we might say in the plan of God, farther back than that. We need to pray that the church will have revelation. We need to pray that pastors who have such an opportunity to bring the Word of God to their people will begin to understand this mystery that Paul talks about, this revelation. It's not that Israel has been set aside, it is that we, the wild branch, have been grafted in. And that we can stand with our Jewish, our older brother we could say, our Jewish older brother. We could stand with them in this hour, we could pray for them. I, as a pastor, I long to teach my congregation about the feasts of the Lord that Israel celebrates because in this way we begin to understand that the plan of God expressed through the Jewish nation. And then we can become one new man, Jew and Gentile alike. Pray that God's revelation will permeate His church all over the earth and we'll begin to understand how important it is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, to support the Jewish nation in this hour of crisis, which is nothing new. It has been this way since Israel was a nation all the way back in the Old Testament period and certainly since 1948 and again today. We as Christians can pray that the power of our God, that His revelation, will permeate His church and we will stand with and support the people called the Jews. Thank you for the privilege of allowing us, Christians for Israel and Israel Vision, of bringing you the truth behind the news and bringing it, bringing this good word from Jerusalem, even as the prophets. God bless you. Shalom. Peace. Good morning and welcome, everyone. The last time I met Dean, he was in my uh, other office near the Western Wall uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, it was like generations ago because it was before the elections in Israel <coughs> when there was still an imminent danger that uh, the city of Jerusalem will be divided. And then I uh, decided uh, to move symbolically my office from this beautiful place uh, into the uh, uh, area uh, 
bordering the uh, uh, plaza of the uh, Western Wall in order to uh, emphasize that which for me is very natural, I'm sure for you is very natural, but it wasn't quite natural for the Israeli government of the day, the very strong and deep connection uh, of the Jewish people to the uh, holiest of all places in Jerusalem and uh, in order to uh, rally uh, around us uh, the uh, a great number of uh, Israeli people uh, to support uh, the uh, demand that the city of Jerusalem uh, will not be divided and naturally that the holy places will not be uh, given uh, to the Palestinians. You are part of a democratic society. You are familiar with democracies and with elections. And I'm sure that you know that in no other country has there been such a wide margin between two candidates on elections. So it certainly is not a, just a result of the natural political process. It must have been with the intervention of God that yeah. wanted that everyone yeah. in the world will see that if someone <coughs> dares to offer the division of Jerusalem, then he is not just losing the elections, he is defeated in such a way that it will become a precedent that no one else will ever try to follow. Amen. One must understand that dividing a city like Jerusalem is against the nature of things. To do it voluntarily, to want to do it, is to not just to make a political mistake, is to do something which is against the, the nature of things as they were set forth by God for so many years because God wanted this city to be a one united and undivided capital of Israel. Amen. And he didn't want this city to be a divided city torn <laughs> apart and a city that is a source of almost endless confrontations instead of a source of great inspiration, as it was destined to be from the outset. As I say, united we will go, united we will win. Thank you very much. We are here as Christians for Israel from Canada. We come from one sea, from another sea, French and English, black and white, our First Nations uh, are represented amongst here. Symbolically, we want to let you know that what we desire for our nation is that we would not be undivided from Jerusalem. And what we have done is we've collected the Canadian waters and we've also collected waters from all over Israel. And well, we have some pioneers of love for Israel, Merla Watson and Jay Rawlings over here that have spent many years laboring with the church in Canada to love Jerusalem, to love Israel. I would like to ask Marilla to play a special song for you while I ask our First Nations people, Judy and Joan, to come up with a bottle of the water that's already mixed of the Canadians and pour it in here. And our young children, who are going to be a generation representing a new generation rising up in Canada to love Israel, to love Jerusalem, to come up and together while it's played, please pour your waters into this jar in which we'd like to give to you.
Mayor Omert is the Chairman of Christians for Israel for Canada. I too want to thank you for the great privilege of being here with you and that you've taken time out of a very busy schedule which become, has become busier because your party won the election to thank you for taking time to see us. When the Christians for Israel International Board met in Jerusalem in November of 1999, the mayor graciously made available to us one of the boardrooms on this, the sixth floor of City Hall, and here we met for our meeting. At that time, he told us about his great concern that Jerusalem was on the negotiating table of the nations. He asked us, as the international representatives on the board, to take that concern to our nations, to get our nations to pray and to stand in support of one Jerusalem, one Israel. We took his words. We applied them literally in paper in our magazine. This one shows the image of Jerusalem with the black zigzag line down through the center to tell Canadian Christians that this is what is at risk, a divided Jerusalem which will not please God and which we are against as well. And then our most recent magazine with the maple leaf of our Canadian flag and the Star of David of the flag of Israel with the caption declaring, it's time for Canada to bless Israel. Amen. We brought as well these declarations, the declaration that you wrote saying that Jerusalem must not be divided. And we distributed these across Canada. They contain thousands of signatures saying, Meromer, we stand with you. And now that you've won the election, these signatures say, we're going to continue to pray for you that all things will come to pass to please the Lord God Almighty. Thank you. We are your Thank friends. You. We stand with you and with Jerusalem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your time today. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you all and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Awake, oh Israel. Put off thy slumber and the truth. right. We had the honor and the privilege of hearing a heart cry out. And the beauty is that you hear the cry of a people that fears the God of Israel, that knows that they're to walk in his commandments, that knows that those commandments give the truth of what is reality. 
to hear his heart, to hear that rallying cry, to hear the privilege of the recognition that yes, we recognize that you who believe in the God of Israel are our friends, are one with us, stand with us. What incredible motivation to take back to our own people, to unite their hearts, not only to pray for Israel, but to bless them in whatever means the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, would lead us into. That's what it meant to me. The concept of praying for Israel on a regular basis, could you explain to me how you feel about that as pastors, of the importance of it? We've really been led by God that the apple of his eye is, is Israel and Jerusalem and he wants to make Jerusalem a praise. And in order for that to happen, we as the Gentile church, we've been grafted in and he's called us forth to, to, to bring it from heaven on earth and make it an, a, re, a reality. And we're here in Jerusalem and everything's so compact together, just like it speaks of in Psalm 122. And we're, we're commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so we've really taken that to heart as, as God's heart. He loves these people. They hold the keys for, for His glory coming forth. And we want the, the glory of God to come to the nations. And the only way to do that is if we take up the mantle, the responsibility He's given us by calling us in to this olive tree and, and saying, this is your responsibility. This is why you're here, to make my people jealous and to, to pray them into the kingdom and pray for peace in this land, which is just, right now, you just feel at times the tension, the heaviness, and God, he's, His plans are just unfolding before our eyes here. What about you, Ian? How do you feel about uh, establishing prayer groups across Canada for Israel? What's really spoken to me, Jay, is uh, Scripture in Romans chapter 9 that it's not our desire or our effort, but it's God's mercy that He plants the seed. That we would have a desire to, you know, to come to visit the people, but even to pray in sustained prayer, mm -hmm. fervent prayer, intercession where there is a sacrifice made in order to stand in the gap um, on behalf of the land, that the land would no longer be cursed. And uh, you know, we, we sensed a, a taste of it just outside the Lion Gate. Met an Arab walking his donkey. Okay, no <laughs> Crazy, no smile. <laughs> you like it, peace, no peace, no smile. How do you go? He spoke about the peace for Christians, Jews, and Arabs, mm. you know, in this place. And so we have the privilege to see that reality come. Psalm 121, 22, verse 6, that we would take up that mantle that we would walk in our spiritual authority and proclaim what we do not see as though it is, is, and it shall be. Will it bring a blessing, do you think? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, but it, but it comes back to who created the desire and who, who stirs up the motivation and who gives the will to accomplish it. I want to take a few moments and share with you from the Word of God in context. Behind me is the Temple Mount. And just below me, the Valley of Kidron. And on that Temple Mount is where the great Second Temple stood. But in AD 70, the Roman legions, having breached the walls of Jerusalem, destroyed the Second Temple. And in fact, they killed hundreds of thousands of Jews in the streets of Jerusalem. That triggered the great diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews into all nations. But we live in a new day. And God is doing according to the prophets. He's bringing his people, the Jews, back to the land of Israel. They're rebuilding their homes. They're settling on the mountains and hills of this promised land. Let me share with you for a few moments from the Word of God as it is found in Matthew 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, right behind me across the valley of Kidron. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. This was a massive, impressive structure, um, refurbished, if you like, and, and added to by Herod the Great. He was called great because of his amazing architectural wonders, the fortresses that he built, the palaces. He was a great master builder. But Jesus responded to the disciples and, in a sense, took away the, the joy of impression of this great temple. He said to them, Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another 
that shall not be thrown down. There is no temple behind me today. His words were fulfilled in A.D. 70. But then in verse 3 we read, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, now I am standing on a rooftop on the Mount of Olives, somewhere in this vicinity, Jesus was sitting. And the disciples came to him privately. He, had, he told them about the destruction of the temple. Surely they were, they were shocked. But now they wanted to understand on a deeper level just what he meant. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? You who know your scripture so well know the signs that he gave. He said there would be time of deception. Many would come saying that they were the Christ, but Christians should not be deceived by them. And then he said there'd be wars and rumors of wars, but even then they, the Christians were not to be troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now this is difficult to hear because it talks about suffering and pain, death, killing. But I want to bring you good news from Jerusalem this morning. Jesus said that the signs would merely point to his coming. And with his coming to this very place, to the Mount of Olives, we remember that in the book of Acts, that as the disciples looked on him, he began to ascend until the clouds received him out of their sight. And it was then that the angel spoke and said to the disciples, why do you, as if to say, look longingly up into heaven? This same Jesus who has ascended from you into heaven will so come in like manner. Zechariah gives us more detail in chapter 14 at a time when the nations, the armies of the earth, surround Jerusalem and once again the life of this city of peace is threatened. This will bring the second coming of Jesus Christ to this very mountain. Zechariah tells us that the mountain will split, cleave in the midst. Half of it will move towards the north, uh, to my left as it were, and half of it toward the south, to my right. And it will create a valley, and perhaps that valley will be to that eastern gate. Today it is sealed, but in that day, when he comes, it will be open, and he will once again enter the city, city where his feet walked in ancient times. And he will rule and reign from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will have peace, and the world will have peace. Is not this not good news? Is it not a hope for us in this day of crisis? when there is confusion in the world and uh, many leaders are troubled trying to find solutions to problems that seem inescapable in spite of all the negotiation. But we have good news. Can I ask you to pray? Pray fervently for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray that this land so torn apart by strife, her streets, her hills so stained by blood, will finally know peace. Let us as Christians in Canada and around the world join our hearts together to pray, even as the scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let me thank you for your prayers. Be encouraged. God's will will be done in Jerusalem and in the whole earth. God bless you. Shalom from Jerusalem. Today, the battle for Jerusalem has actually intensified, and we know that it will increase and grow according to the Word of God in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, where it mentions that all the nations are going to come against Jerusalem, being in the hands of the Jewish people as an undivided capital. It is uh, the first time since 1967 that Jerusalem has not been in the hands of the Gentiles. With these scriptures in mind and the facts of the desperate situation all around us, let's discuss some prayer points uh, that you can enter into right now. Number one, pray for the Palestinian people. Those who are just caught in the grips of this intifada, ordinary people, hard-working people, they are suffering because they are not allowed to come and work inside of Israel. They also suffer because of the lies, graft, and corruption of the Palestinian leadership. If you know Palestinians, you can send them parcels of food and packages, perhaps with clothing, especially give them gospels as you send them gifts of love. 
We also need to pray against the Palestinian propaganda machine <clears throat> that to increasingly be exposed. Please pray for the new government of Israel that is just being formed as we speak under the leadership of our new Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, who won 62% of the vote. He has given Arafat the ultimatum, if you want to talk peace, quit the violence. These are the serious issues that we have brought up before you for prayer this month. And as you go before the Lord, just wait on him, seek his face, and he will even inspire you with other things to pray for that we haven't brought up through the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you from Jerusalem. We love you and thank you for standing with us in this hour. Thank you. What a great army you are.